everyone. Uh, I just want to briefly introduce Momiji Healthcare Society. Uh, we are a non-profit charitable organization. We are located at uh, Markham Road and Kingston Road in the Scarborough. It's a non um, supportive housing for primary Japanese Canadian seniors. We have around 160 seniors living at the Momiji. So uh, we provide uh, services for seniors over 60 years old of age and their caregivers. Uh, right now, during the COVID, we are providing uh, services uh, uh, online. So if you like to know more about our online program, please contact me. Thank you. Thanks, Keiko. And my name is Chie. I am a social worker at the Japanese Social Services. JHS is a non-profit agency located at the second floor of Japanese Canadian Cultural Center in North York providing counseling and programs in Japanese and English. So uh, we're uh, working remote only currently, as may, many other uh, agencies are doing. So I'm from home. And so if you can uh, leave us a message at our uh, recognizing uh, numbers or emails, uh, we can get back to you as soon as possible. And we are having a fundraising Toronto Challenge uh, Walkathon slash Marathon event so that's happening uh, this actually Sunday, June 20th. Uh, we, uh, so we're participating, our staff and some volunteers are running and uh, virtually, um, I mean, we're trying to connect virtually, but they're actually running and marathoning and uh, walking. So um, we are asking uh, for you to support us through uh, donating uh, through our uh, website. So if you want to know more about it, please uh, let me know. And we're also providing online programs uh, for the Japanese speaking individuals, such as chair yoga for people uh, aged uh, 55 plus, and craft craft social, uh, hot lunch social group, and uh, phone conversation with social worker program. So uh, if you're interested in learning about it more, um, feel free to let me know. I'll get back to you as soon as possible. And this is about us. And now I would like to uh, pass it over to our amazing guest speaker of today, uh, Ms. Vina Fieldman and Ms. Uh, Marianne um, Sekuti. Sorry, <laughs> okay, Ms. Uh, Marianne Sekuti. Okay, so Vina, take it away, please. How's that? Do you see that? Yes. Great. Well, thank you for inviting us to speak with your crowd today. You know, we are living in very strange times, everyone will agree, when dying and death is being reported in unbelievable numbers in countries across the globe, in cities across Canada, in our neighborhoods, among our friends and for some even family members. We're certainly thinking more about death and dying during this pandemic. I'm Bina Feldman, and I'll be delivering your presentation today along with my colleague, Marianne Sicuti. Marianne is a subject matter expert on medical assistance in dying, and she is the chairperson of Dying with Dignity Canada GTA chapter. And as I said, we're very appreciative to be here today and tell you more about MAID. I'm having trouble advancing the slide. Here we are. My mother died at the age of 101, and she played bridge on her second to last day. And she often said to me, Bina, you have to be lucky in life and lucky in death. She was one of the lucky ones, but we know not everyone is that lucky. She sometimes talked to me about death and she told me she wasn't afraid to die and that I shouldn't be afraid either. When I think back now, 
I'm so appreciative that she told me that, and I hope to relay the same thing to my children. It's time that we all started to talk more about death and dying. I'd like to share the objectives of our presentation here today. And the objectives are simple, so please try to remember this. If you remember only one thing out of everything I'm gonna to say today, remember this. If you have knowledge of the options available to you, then that will give you choices in your planning and decision-making. Ultimately, it gives you more control for your end of life situation. So knowledge gives you choice and choice gives you control. That's an important element of what we're gonna talk about today. But let me go through the agenda. What are we gonna cover? Well, first of all, I'm gonna tell you about Dying with Dignity Canada. You see the letters up there, DWDC. What is made and how did it get to be legal in Canada? Some of you may have been reading in the paper that the law recently changed regarding MAID. So I'm gonna tell you about that as well, the changes to the law. And I'll tell you about what's coming down the road with regard to medical assistance in dying. After I'm finished, should be about 30 minutes, 25 minutes, then we'll take your questions and Mary Ann Sakuti will answer them. So let's start with an understanding of Dying with Dignity Canada. And the first thing I want to tell you is that we are a human rights charity. We started in Ontario 40 years ago, and we grew to a national organization, and now we have over 2,500 members. What do we do? We defend human rights by advocating for assisted dying rules that respect the Canadian Constitution and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. We receive no government funding. We're fully privately funded by average citizens who are seeking the right to die with dignity and to have more control over death and dying. In a recent poll, Ipsos Re poll, over 80% of Canadians supported medical assistance in dying for those who meet the eligibility criteria and I'm gonna talk more about that coming up. What is our focus? Our focus is fourfold, eligibility, access, support, and education. We are committed to protecting end of life rights, improving the quality of dying, and helping Canadians avoid unwanted suffering. With regard to eligibility, we ensure that assisted dying legislation complies with the Canadian Constitution and the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Around access, we ensure that everyone has access to information and they can access made in compliance with the law, with the Constitution and with the Charter. We offer support to people, their families, caregivers, medical people, anyone who wants more information about end of life options, and that includes MAID. And we give educational programs such as the one we're he giving here today for average citizens like yourself, anyone who wants to learn more about MAID, medical community, about end of life options, including MAID and advanced care planning. So how do we do this? Well, we support and intervene in court challenges that are related to Bill C-14. Bill C-14 is the federal legislation that allows for MAID. And I'm gonna be talking about that shortly if you're not familiar. We work to ensure that doctors who object to MAID are obliged to give people who ask them, they're obliged to refer them to other doctors or agencies that will give them the information that they need. So making effective referrals for MAID if they themselves don't want to get involved. We provide information, emotional and personal support 
and resources to those who are interested in MAID. So let's actually define MAID. I'm going to give you a minute to read this slide and then I'll tell you. So what is medical assistance in dying, often called MAID? It's the administration of a substance by a doctor or nurse practitioner at the person's request that causes their death. Or prescription or providing a substance to a person, again, at their request for self-administration that causes their death. Let's look at how MAID became legal in Canada. And these three women were very important in that uh, journey. The top one, the youngest one is Sue Rodriguez, was Sue Rodriguez. In 1993, Sue Rodriguez was living in British Columbia and she was suffering from ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, a terrible disease. And she took her case to the Supreme Court and she asked the court, if I cannot give consent to my own death, whose body is this? Who owns my life? Well, the Supreme Court of Canada upheld the criminal code provision in a five to four decision. In other words, it was a very tight vote. But in the end, it was still illegal to assist somebody in their own death, 1993. In 1994, Sue Rodriguez took her own life with the help of an anonymous physician by taking a combination of morphine and cecobarbital. She accomplished her goal. Let's fast forward 20 years and on the bottom right, we meet two women, Gloria Taylor, uh, Gloria, Gloria Taylor, yes, on the bottom left. She also suffered from ALS like Sue Rodriguez and Kay Carter on the bottom right. And um, she suffered from degenerative spinal stenosis. And both these women fought vigorously in the courts on, the, on behalf of all Canadians for the right to die with dignity. Unfortunately, neither of them lived to see the fruits of their labor. Kay Carter went to Switzerland and she got assisted she got help from a physician for assisted death. And Switzerland was the only country at that time that allowed non-citizens the right to access physician-assisted dying. And Gloria Taylor died of a severe infection in 2012. But let's look at what happened in the courts. <clears throat> Kay Carter's case went up to the Supreme Court and excuse me, in February 2015, the Supreme Court determined unanimously, in other words, before it was a five to four decision, but by 2015, it was a unanimous decision that the prohibition on assisted, physician assisted dying infringes on the right to life, liberty, and the security of the person. And as a result of that decision, that very important decision, we have Bill C-14 that allowed for medical assistance in dying, which came into law June 2016. And that's not very long ago, 2016. Since June 2016, over 13,000 Canadians have accessed assisted death to release them from their pain and suffering. I told you that 85% of Canadians were uh, supportive of medical assistance in dying for those who meet the eligibility criteria. And these eligibility criteria are very important. They're safeguards. Not anyone can just say, I want to have MAID and they can get it. No, they have to be eligible. And there's a very a detailed assessment to determine this eligibility. So let's look at these eligibility criteria. 
Well, first of all, you have to be eligible for OHIP, publicly funded health in, in Ontario. You have to be 18 and mentally competent to make this very important decision in your own health care. You have to have a grievous and irremediable medical condition. That's a complicated one, so I'm going to tell you more about that on the next slide. You have to be making this request all on your own, and the doctor who's making the assessment has to determine that nobody is forcing you to make this decision. You know, there's no coercion involved. And the person must be aware of all medical options available to them so that they are able to give informed consent ultimately just before the procedure is performed. So these are the eligibility criteria. Now let's go back and look at this one, grievous and irremediable condition. What is a grievous and irremediable condition? It's an incurable illness, disease, or disability that cannot be reversed and in a state of advanced decline. You have to be experiencing intolerable physical and psychological suffering and your natural death has to be reasonably foreseeable. The physical and psychological suffering, just going back for a minute, it cannot be relieved under any conditions that you find acceptable to you. So if they are suggesting something to relieve your condition that you don't like, that you find unacceptable, you don't have to take it. But your natural death has to be reasonably foreseeable. And I put that in red because that was the focus of recent changes to the law. And so it, it really requires more discussion. But first, let me introduce you to two important Quebecers. The gentleman was Jean Touchon. In 2019, he was suffering very badly from advanced uh, complicated cerebral palsy. And beside him was a woman, Nicole Gladue, who suffered very badly from post-polio syndrome. And both of these Quebecers took their case to the Supreme Court of Quebec to challenge the eligibility criteria of reasonably foreseeable death in order to access MAID. The Quebec Supreme Court ruled that the need for a reasonably foreseeable death in order to access MAID was unconstitutional. And the federal government accepted that decision. So as a result of that important court case, we have Bill C-7. And Bill C-7 was an amendment to the criminal code which allowed people, it broadened the eligibility for those people seeking MAID. In other words, if your death was not reasonably foreseeable, you can now apply for MAID. In March 2021, just a few months ago, a very short time ago, Bill C-7 received royal assent and became law in Canada. So what does that mean, actually? It means that now we have a two-track system. We have one track of people seeking MAID whose death is reasonably foreseeable, and one track of people seeking MAID whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. It's a little complicated, but let's look at it again. Let's we'll take a step back and look at the reasonably foreseeable death criteria that was part of the original Bill C-14. In fact, it was a very ambiguous legal term and doctors had a hard time interpreting it. The medical community found it difficult to make assessments and to really understand the intent and apply that term to the law. What were the issues? Well, chronically ill Canadians with enduring pain and intolerable suffering 
were not um, uh, eligible because they're, although they were chronically ill, their death was not naturally foreseeable. Also, the original bill had a lot of inconsistencies in that different doctors would assess individuals and they would determine if their death was reasonably foreseeable and sometimes doctors didn't agree on this criteria. So Bill C-7 changed all that because now your death didn't have to be reasonably foreseeable in order for you to be eligible for MAID. Let's look at the important safeguards in place in this law. So here we see a, a table and on the left side are people whose death is reasonably foreseeable and on the right side, people's death is not reasonably foreseeable. And let's look at these safeguards around there applying for MAID. So MAID application starts with a written request. And if your death is reasonably foreseeable, the person has to have been told that their condition is irremediable and they have to have been informed of all options available to relieve suffering, including palliative care. On the other side, if your death is not reasonably foreseeable, you also have to been, have been informed about all medical options available to you to relieve your suffering. And these options include counseling services, mental health and disability support services, community services, palliative care, and these people must be offered consultations with professionals who provide these services. And their doctors must all agree that the alternative means to relieve suffering has been considered. Every other means has been considered. Going to the second level, medical assessin, assessments. Two medical people must assess individuals seeking MAID. Those could be a doctor and or a nurse practitioner. For people whose death is reasonably foreseeable, neither one of those assessors needs to have expertise in their condition. But over on the next side, if your death is not reasonably foreseeable, one of the people making that assessment for your eligibility must have expertise in your condition. So in the case of Jean Touchant, the person who assessed him had to have expertise in cerebral palsy. And if there are two people assessing and doing the assessment and neither one of them has expertise, then a third assessor is brought in. Somebody with expertise in the condition must be part of the assessment. Going down to wait period, if your death is reasonably foreseeable, there could be a very short or even no wait period. However, if your death is not reasonably foreseeable, then after your first assessment, after your second assessment, you need to wait 90 days. And we call this a reflection period before medical assistance in dying can be performed. So 90 days, three months, is the waiting period for people whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. A very important safeguard. For those whose death is reasonably foreseeable, they can waive the final consent, the consent that must be given just, just before the procedure is performed. For those whose Death is not reasonably foreseeable, consent must be given. So you can see that there are important differentials between people whose death is certain and people whose death is not reasonably foreseeable. The important thing I want to stress here is that the person who is requesting MAID at any time can change their mind and say, I've decided to put the whole thing on hold. I've changed my mind. I'm not going to go through with it. And I want to look at how the MAID process rolls out, but I want you to keep that in mind that even though a patient, a person may start the inquiry, start the ball rolling for medical assistance in dying, 
they can change their mind at any time, right up until the final, final moment, and that's okay. So how does the MADE process roll out? Well, it begins with an initial inquiry. When a person asks their medical provider, their doctor, what are the options available to me to relieve my pain and suffering? And the doctor has to give them all options available to them, including MADE. But like I said earlier, what happens if this doctor doesn't support medical assistance in dying, just themselves, they don't support it. In Ontario, they are obliged. They are obliged to refer that patient to someone who will give him or her the information that they're seeking. So after the initial inquiry and the person gets information, they must fill out a written request only they themselves can fill out the written request. Nobody else can do it for them. In Ontario, that written request is called a clinician aid A form. There might be some other forms for certain hospitals, but that's the main one. And the request must come directly from the individual and it'll establish their eligibility for the MAID process, that they're capable cognitively of making this request and that they understand their condition fully and that they understand all the other options available to them, including palliative care. The request must be signed by an independent witness and that independent witness also has to have specific criteria. There are certain people who can sign and certain people who cannot. What happens if the person requesting MAID is not able to use their hands and they can't sign? Well, an authorized third party can sign the written request and those people have certain criteria that they have to um, meet in order to be a person who can sign the request. Once again, lots of safeguards. Now comes the assessment a doctor or a nurse practitioner comes in, well, you know, in pre-pandemic days, they went to do it live. Nowadays, they're doing it uh, on Zoom. But they read all the medical reports and they interview the person very extensively, maybe one visit, maybe two visits, any number of visits that they want before that medical person will determine if these people meet the very strict eligibility criteria. After they determine what they think in terms of eligibility, they leave and a second independent assessor comes in and does the same thing all over again. Studies the medical charts, interviews the person extensively and they determine their uh, assessment, whether the person meets the eligibility criteria for MAID. Once both independent assessors agree, then, then um, the, the procedure can be planned. But what, what happens for those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable? Well, like I said earlier, for those whose death is not reasonably foreseeable, at least one of those two assessors must have expertise in the person's condition. And after the assessment, that person must wait 90 days and reflect if they still want to go through with it. If a person isn't satisfied with the assessments that they got or they don't like the answer that they got for their request for MAID, they can get a third assessor or even a fourth. So once the procedure, once the assessors agree that you meet, met the eligibility criteria, then the medical person goes and gets the prescription, picks up the drugs, that are needed on the day that MAID is to be provided. Prior to the administration of the drugs, the person receiving MAID is asked again if they give final consent to the procedure. And they must answer verbally. If they cannot speak, they must answer non-verbally. And then again, they can say, I changed my mind right at the last minute, and that's okay too. 
if the consent has been given or if the person person's death is reasonably foreseeable and the consent has been waived the drugs are administered for a very quiet peaceful death that takes about 10 minutes death is pronounced and a death certificate is issued and you can go to our website on dying with dignity canada and read some of the personal stories from family members in in the blog that tells you how peaceful the death was how dignified the death was and how this is what their family member wanted people describe it as a very peaceful calm non-painful experience i want to introduce you now to audrey parker audrey parker in 2018 she lived in halifax she suffered from stage four breast cancer that had metastasized to her brain. She applied for MAID and she was accepted under the eligibility of having a reasonably foreseeable death. Audrey really wanted one final Christmas with her family, but she was afraid that she was losing her mental capacity because the cancer had metastasized to her brain and she realized she, she, wasn't, she wasn't thinking clearly. And she worried that if she waited until after Christmas, she wouldn't be able to give final consent. So she chose to die in November. But Audrey realized that there was something wrong with the law when she was eligible for MAID, but she couldn't delay her final consent. She couldn't waive her final consent. And Gratefully, legislators also agreed that this wasn't a good system. And so Bill C-7 has something that we call Audrey's Amendment, which allows people to waive their final consent if they receive, if they were, if their death is reasonably foreseeable. So it's a waiver of final consent that we now have under Bill C-7. But we're not finished with changes to the law that need to take place. And over the next two years, there's going to be a comprehensive review of MAID legislation in Canada by a joint committee of Parliament and the Senate. And this review is going to address some very important topics. One, mental illness as the sole condition. The government is going to hear from experts and develop safeguards and protocols for anyone who falls under this category as their sole condition for seeking MAID. They're also going to look at MAID and dementia and advance requests for MAID. In other words, if you have the onset of dementia, are you going to be able to give an advance request for a period when you won't be able to recognize your family or you may not be able to toilet yourself? So you can make that request while you still have your faculties for a time when you no longer have your faculties and you, and you don't want to live like that. They're going to look at the issue of MAID and Canadians with disabilities and how to protect Canadians with disabilities. And they're going to look at the issue of mature minors. A mature minor is defined in law as a child of any age who is capable of providing consent if they have maturity, intelligence, and the capacity to understand the nature and purpose and consequences of this important decision. So these are some of the topics that's going to be that are going to be reviewed in the next two years. So it's a lot of work over uh, a short period of time, but very important work. Let me summarize some key points that I want you to take away from this presentation. First of all, MAID is legal and it is your right as a Canadian. It's important to know all your end of life options so that you can have choice in your end of life scenario. Remember that only you can request MAID. No one else can do it on your behalf. 
and you cannot be pressured into doing it. You cannot be pressured by someone else. And if you get the ball rolling and you decide to change your mind, you can withdraw your request for made at any time. Every story has a beginning, a middle, and an end. The more we participate in writing the ending of our own story, the more satisfied we are with the arc of our life. Made allows for planning, being in the place you want with the people and the things around you at the, that you want at the end of your life. It's very reassuring and comforting for both the person, their family, their loved ones, their friends. And it's been described as very peaceful and comforting way to die. At Dying with Dignity Canada, we believe that everyone has the right to a good death. Thank you, and I'm going to turn it over now to Marion.